What's up, engineers? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about the structure and function of the cytoskeleton. That includes microtubules, that includes the intermediate filaments and the microfilaments, which will go into each one individually, going over the structure and then subsequently their function. Before we get started, if you guys like this video, it helps you, it makes sense, please support us. And the best way you can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. You guys already know that. Also, if you guys really want to follow along with some great notes, illustrations, check that out on our website. We'll have a link down in the description box below to take you there and check that out. All right, let's get started. So cytoskeleton, there's three primary components. Okay, so what I want you to remember. Microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. We're going to go through each one of these talking about their structure and subsequently their function. So the first one being microfilaments. The biggest thing to know about these is that these are going to be the smallest of all of the cytoskeletal elements. So this is definitely going to be the smallest. But we should know what it's made up of. So another name for a microfilament is actually known as actin. This is another name for a microfilament. And again, I think the big thing to remember is it's going to be the smallest of the cytoskeletal elements, but it's also going to be the most flexible, which is a really cool kind of attribute to this. So we have actin, which is the primary microfilament. Now, when we talk about this, it's actually made up of these cool like little monomers. So you have like these little monomers here, and these are called G-actin. <laughs> and what happens is, if we take these G-actin molecules together and we fuse them together, we actually polymerize them and form something called a polymer in this case. So we're gonna form a polymer. This is one of the polymers. This is gonna be called F-actin, so F-actin. So this is the polymer form. So we take the G-actin, the individual monomers, link them together like Legos, and then eventually form F-actin, which is our polymer. Then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna take two of these polymers and we're gonna form this like double helix, if you will, of actin. So this will be a F-actin here, and this will be an F-actin here. Isn't that pretty cool? So that's your actual structure of the microfilament actin. And the question has to come from this, which is, what in the heck does actin do? Well, we know it's the smallest, and we know it's the most flexible. But it's obviously the key function of the cytoskeleton is to perform uh, a, in a job of being able to maintain the shape of the cell. It's allowing for the, sh the cell to be able to allow for particular movements and allowing for the cell to adapt to compressive forces. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So specifically, with the microfilaments, one of the cool things about this is that it can actually form like these, it can little polymerize and cause a cell to be able to squeeze and change its morphology to fit through tiny spaces. That's because of the flexibility factor. So one of the greatest examples of this is a process called diapodesis. So there is a process called a diapodesis. I really want you guys to remember this. And it's basically here you have your white blood cell. So this is a white blood cell here and this is a white blood cell here. What I can do is, is I can literally through the actin molecules have it change the cell shape. And if I have it change the cell shape, it now may be able to squeeze itself through these tiny little capillary components here. You see how now this puppy is squeezing through these actual spaces, the intercellular clefts, between these capillaries. So this will allow for white blood cells to be able to squeeze and move out of the blood vessel and into the tissue spaces, which is really important, right? Because white blood cells are in the blood, but then if there is a nasty pathogen, let's say, that's out here in the extracellular fluid here, so it's actually sitting out in here into the interstitial spaces, I want these white blood cells to be able to move out of the blood and into the interstitial spaces to go and fight these particular bacteria so that they can you know, phagocytize them and kill them, right? So that's really one of these cool processes is that actin molecules, they will allow for the movement, so they'll depolymerize and polymerize at different places and allow for the cell to change its shape and squeeze through tiny spaces. Tell me that's not cool. The second thing that it can also do is something called cell division. So, there's different phases, right, of mitosis. So we're not gonna go through each one of these, but there's prophase, there's also something called metaphase, then you have something called anaphase, and then you have something called telophase, and then technically there's this like 
little subsection here called cytokinesis. And this is really a phase that's kind of like very dynamic and pretty much in action. And then here you get your two daughter cells. This is the process of mitosis, right? So you start off with one cell, and then at the end of this you form one, one, your two daughter cells. Now, what actin does is, it really kind of comes in here at this point, and it forms like this constriction ring. So imagine it forming kind of this like little squeezing ring that's gonna kind of like pinch, if you will, these two cells apart. It's gonna create a little constriction ring. I'm gonna call this a constrictive ring, a constriction ring, if you will. And it's going to pinch these two cells apart. That's a really cool concept of the uh, microfilaments or the actin function. So one of the particular functions in cell division is it allows for, it helps in stimulating the cytokinesis by separating, using that actin constriction ring to separate one cell into two cells. So that's a really cool function as well. All right, so so far we've covered cell uh, migration, allowing for it to change its shape to squeeze through small spaces. And on top of that, allows for it to form a constriction ring during cell division to separate one cell into two cells during the mitotic process. Okay, let's come down. A couple more functions of these microfilaments, or actin, is they can form cell extensions. And this is really, really cool. So. When we talk about these, imagine here you have these like little extensions. You see these kind of coming off of the cell? So naturally you would have two parts of a cell membrane. You would have this apical portion, which we call like the top of the cell, and then you would have this basal portion, which we would call kind of like the bottom of the cell. Well, on the apical surface, the actin filaments can literally kind of form like the core of these like little projections. So imagine here's your actin filaments, and they're literally forming like the core of these like finger-like projections or extensions that are coming off the apical surface. That's pretty cool, right? And so what this allows for is these allow them to kind of have a little bit of movement. And so it forms two particular things. One is it forms something called the microvilli. And the microvilli are gonna be the smallest cellular extension on the apical surface. The other one is going to be what's called the stereocilia, and they're gonna be just a little bit bigger than the microvilli that are present on the apical surface. So when you talk about these in comparison to size, this one is small extension, this one is larger extension that is actually formed by the actin filaments projecting out of the apical membrane, giving these kind of like finger-like projections. Isn't that cool? Now you ask the question, okay, what do these finger-like projections do? I got you. One of these is that they are super, super prominent in the gastrointestinal tract. So as food or fluids are running through your GIT, they come into contact with these microvilli. And what these do is they increase the surface area for digestion and absorption. That's the primary function of microvilli. So one of the big things to remember is they increase surface area. For what? In this case, for digestion and absorption in the GIT. That's pretty cool. The stereocilia, they actually beat. And when they move, they, depending upon their movement, it opens up little channels that are present on those actual little finger-like projections that are super involved in your inner ear. And what they do is, so they're involved in your inner ear, your, uh, what's particularly, there's different parts of your hearing. So there's the vestibular function, which is involved in your balance, and then there's the cochlear function, which is actually involved in hearing. This is involved in both. So it's involved in both balance, and it's also involved in hearing. And that's a really, really important function. So I want you to remember that microvilli are you know, very, very important cellular extensions formed by actin that are involved in increasing the surface area of the GIT. And the stereocilia are going to be these actin extensions that are super involved in the inner ear, which helps to play a role in balance and hearing. Okay, the next component here, my friends, is the cell junctions. So this is basically helping the cells to stick to one another. So here I have cell one. Here I have cell two. I want these cells to stick to one another and not separate. 
How do I do that? I use these particular actin filaments. They're a component of these cell junctions. We will talk about these a little bit more when we get into the video on cell junctions. But in this concept here, actin filaments are key in the formation of two particular types of cell junctions, which helps to keep cells tight together. So it helps to be able to keep these cells, it prevents the cells from, prevents cells from separating which is a really cool thing. And there's two particular types. One is there's called tight junctions, and we'll talk about these a little bit later. And the other one is called adherence junctions. Adherence junctions. And these are ones that are very, very heavily involved with, again, utilizing actin as their primary, one of their big components in these cell junctions. So, so far, we have cell migration, allowing for the cell to kind of change its shape and squeeze through tiny little spaces in the blood vessels. White blood cells, this is called diapedesis. We said cell division, it's important that the last part of mitosis called cytokinesis, where it forms a constriction ring to pop one cell into two cells. We said it's involved particularly as well as in cellular extension. So it's a core in the finger-like extensions that come off of the apical surface of the cell called small ones, microvilli, big ones, stereocilia. Which one's in the inner ear? Stereocilia. Which one's in the GIT for increasing surface area? That's microvilli. And then we also talked about cell junctions, how they're an integral and component into tight junctions and adherence junctions, preventing the cells from separating from one another and preventing things from being able to move in between these cells. And we'll talk about that more in the cell junction video. Another really cool thing is, okay, here, these blue strands are my actin. Here's my actin in the blue strands. In these red strands here with these like spokes coming off here, this is a motor protein which is associated called myosin. And then here in the blue is called actin. These make up something in our muscles called myofilaments. So this one and this one, with a combination of a couple other proteins, make up the primary components of your myofilament. And this is important in being able to aid in contraction. So what happens is the myosin clicks on with the actin, so it clicks on with the actin, and once it clicks on, I want you to imagine the myosin pulling the actin strands closer to one another and it'll basically cause these filaments to slide and to shorten this entire myofilament, which shortens the muscle. And that's critical in being able to allow for muscle contraction and relaxation. So it's super, super critical in muscle contraction, heavily involved in ATP production as well. Heavily involved in ATP production. All right, the last one that's also really cool is it's involved in a process called endocytosis, where we take things that are outside of the cell and bring them into the cell, right? And the way that we do that is that we may use these actin proteins to help to be able to create this like little invagination into the cell and suck the actual contents into the cell. The other one is we may have what's called exocytosis. And exocytosis may be taking these substances that are in the cell and pushing them out of the cell. And again, in order to be able to elicit this process, we may need some of these actin molecules to fuse here with the cell membrane to engage it and then have it fuse with the cell membrane to release the contents out. So these are the things that the actin filaments or the microfilaments are involved in. Again, smallest, most flexible, made up of G-actin forming F-actin. That makes a polymer. Two polymers make a double helix of your microfilament. It's involved in cell migration, diapedesis. It's involved in cell division, cytokinesis. It's involved in cellular extensions, making microvilli and stereocilia. It's involved in cell junctions, particularly tight junctions and adherence junctions. It's involved in muscle contraction. It's associated with the motor protein, myosin. And whenever myosin binds to actin, it shortens the filaments and has it shorten the muscle, which is involved in muscle contraction. And finally, it's important in being able to allow for things that are outside of the cell to come into the cell, making a endosome, or an endosome that's inside of the cell being secreted and pushed out of the cell. This is endocytosis and exocytosis, respectively. Okay, my friends, let's move on to the next cytoskeletal element, which is your intermediate filaments. All right, my friends, so now intermediate filaments are the next one. So there's actually no like specific kind of monomer 
uh, polymer type of thing or any specific thing that we actually, when we compared it to microfilaments, how it was G actins to F actins to making two of those and making the entire double helix. This one, it's just this like, you know, decent sized. It's actually, you know, I'd say again, if you, based upon the name, it's the middle child. I'm literally gonna write it down. It's the middle child, okay? So it's not the smallest, it's not the biggest. But I will say it's probably the most resilient. Okay, it's probably the most resilient or the most tough out of all of these types of uh, cytoskeletal elements. So it's a super strong, tough, resilient type of protein. Now, <clears throat> one of the really cool things about intermediate filaments is that they can be used clinically. And I find this like super interesting because when you think about it, let's say that you have a tumor cell, um, like you have melanoma, right? There's a particular intermediate filament that is present in the cells of your epithelium. So let's say you're you know, you have melanoma that spreads. So it gets into your bloodstream, spreads, and let's say it goes to your brain. When they go and they actually resect the tumor out and they look at it and they do what's called immunohistochemistry, they can use stains to find the intermediate filaments. And depending upon which one it is, will to determine where the actual tumor came from. And so that's really cool because intermediate filaments can be used as what's called an immunohistochemical marker. So it can be used kind of, if you want to think about it, it actually can be used as what's called a tumor marker. And I think that'll make a little bit more sense after I explain something. So different cells, there's at least five different types, main types of intermediate filaments that are actually very important. The first one is the particular type of intermediate filaments that's super heavily coated with inside, this is a maroonish color here, heavily coated with inside of the nucleus of almost every single cell in our entire body. These are called lamins. So lamins is heavily involved in the cellular nucleus. In the epidermis, so the actual epidermal cells, there's a very specific type of intermediate filament that is specifically kind of coated within these ones. You guys know what this one is? This is called keratin. This is called keratin. There's another one, which depending upon the connective tissue. So it's found in different connective tissues, right? Specifically, if you were to use the cells that actually make connective tissue, this is called fibroblasts, so they're called fibroblasts. There is a specific type of intermediate filament that's actually very heavily coated within these fibroblast cells that make connective tissue. You guys know what this one is? This one is called a vimentin. Vimentin. There's another one which is located in your muscle cells. Just going back here for keratin, which is found in the epithelial cells, just so you remind yourself of that. This is found within the epithelial cells. And then over here, we have muscle cells. So this is gonna be your muscle cells. So this can be your skeletal muscle cells. This could be the smooth muscle cells, the cardiac muscle cells. But in these, there's a very specific type of intermediate filament. And this is called desmin. So this is called desmin. So, so far we have lamins in the nucleus. It's found in the nucleus of almost every single cell. Keratin and epithelial cells. Vimentin and fibroblasts are connective tissue. Desmin and muscle cells. And the last one here is gonna be found within neurons. So within neurons, there's actually gonna be the easiest one to remember here, thank goodness. So here we have the intermediate filaments of muscle cells. Here in this one, you're gonna have neurofilaments. Oh, thank goodness, it's an easy one. So neurofilaments. So these are the different types of intermediate filaments that can be found in these primary tissues. So what I was saying is, let's say that you have a tumor here, a melanoma, right? So for example, what's really cool about this and let's say that someone has a tumor, okay? So here they have melanoma from their epithelium. And then what happens is some of these cells break off, get into your bloodstream, and they spread and they go to the brain tissue. So here's some of your neurons, okay? And then here you're gonna have some of these cancerous epidermal cells that move through the blood and they get over here. Well, when you go and you actually take and look at the intermediate filaments that are present in this brain tissue, when you go and you actually maybe resect a piece of that tissue, what you're gonna find is different intermediate filaments. So here you should have what? Neurofilaments. That'll tell you, okay, that's brain tissue, that's there. But this one will tell you have keratin. And what we can do is when we take this tissue and we put it under a microscope and we actually stain it, we'll be able to find keratin and say, oh, this was probably a, mel a melanoma that spread to the brain. So that's a really cool kind of thing that we can utilize to our advantage. All right, 
Intermediate filaments, middle child, meaning it's the, the middle in size. It's bigger than the microfilaments, smaller than the microtubules, the most tough, most resilient. These are the five primary types that I want you to remember. Importance of this is understanding it can be used as a tumor marker. But what are some other functions to talk about with this one? Honestly, it's really easy. It's probably the easiest out of all of the actual <laughs> cytoskeleton because this is definitely the most tough out of all of them. So really, I want you to think that it's going to resist compressive, forces, for, resist compressive forces. So that's really one of the biggest things, so that whenever there's a lot of compression that's placed onto these cells, these have the ability to keep and maintain the cell shape despite a lot of compressive forces. So that's a really, really cool thing, so that they can maintain shape despite any type of compressive forces. That's a really important thing, my friends. Okay, so that's really kind of highlights how powerful and how tough and how resilient these are. The other thing is that they help to be able to keep cells together. So here's cell one, here's cell two, and then here's what's called your basal lamina. This is basically your connective tissue lining. So you know epithelial cells, they sit on a bed of connective tissue because generally the blood supply is within the basal lamina that supplies these epithelial cells. Well, if I want to keep these two cells stuck together, we already said actin was one. Actin helps to form cell junctions by forming tight junctions and adherence junctions. Well, these are even tougher. So these will really prevent cells from ripping apart. And so because of that, because these are super, super intense types of um, cytoskeletal elements, these will be the toughest of all of the, of the actual cell junctions. You know what these are called? These are called desmosomes. So this one here, this one here is called desmosomes, and they are going to be the toughest of all of the cell junctions. It's really going to prevent cells from ripping apart. Very, very common to have these, um, particularly in cardiac tissue. Very common to have these in cardiac tissue because cardiac tissue has to be able to, again, sometimes they're having a lot of like stretching that's going on from filling with blood and contracting. And you can also find this in the epithelium. So you can also find this in the epithelium as well. The next one is we have to be able to anchor the epithelial cells on a bed of connective tissue. So we want to connect the epidermis to the dermis. And so we have a very strong fiber here that's also kind of present that's very, very critical. And what is this? That's the intermediate films that help to be able to link the cell to the connective tissue bed. What is this one here? This one is called hemidesmosomes. So this is called hemidesmosomes. And this is basically helping to anchor the cell. This is cell to the extracellular matrix. Desmosomes is between cell to cell. That's important to remember. But I think the big thing to take away from intermediate filaments is that they are the middle size but the most tough and resilient. And so because of that, they can maintain the shape of the cell despite compressive forces, and they can really prevent cells like cardiac tissue and epithelial tissue from separating apart via desmosomes, and they can prevent the separation of the epithelium from the dermis via hemidesmosomes. All right, my friends, that covers the intermediate filaments. Now we move on to the next and the last and the biggest of all of them, the microtubules. All right, my friends, off to the last one, the microtubules, the biggest and the baddest of them. This one's actually a really cool one. It has a lot of cool functions and a lot of different structures that we have to talk about. But when we talk about microtubules, so we talked about how microfilaments are made up of G-actin that forms F-actin, which forms polymers, and then we take two of those and make a double helix, right? Then we talked about our intermediate filaments. It wasn't anything special. There wasn't any particular things that we needed to know for the synthesis of it. You just need to know the five types. Lamins, keratin, vimentin, desmin, and neurofilaments. Because those were the big, big types of intermediate filaments that cover the main tissue types. And then we talked about how, you know, the microfilaments are involved in cell migration, cytokinesis, they're also involved in cell extensions, cell to cell junctions, and they're also involved in muscle contraction and membrane transport, endo and exocytosis. Whereas intermediate filaments are involved primarily in really maintaining cell shape despite compressive forces and really sticking cell to cell together, desmosomes, cell to connective tissue together, hemidesmosomes. Microtubules are a little bit more uh, suave, right? They get a little bit more kind of finesse to them, so they're a little bit cooler. So here we have these particular proteins that make them up. So we have something called a alpha tubulin and a beta tubulin. Okay, so this, this, these proteins here are called tubulins. How ironic, right? <clears throat> 
Then what we're going to do is we're going to take these tubulins together, we're going to fuse them together. And then we get a dimer. So we literally get a tubulin dimer. And generally, in order for these dimers to be able to kind of get added on and to make these, generally it requires some degree of GTP to be added into this process. But what we do is we take the tubulin dimers and we just kind of click and click and click and click and we make this long chain. And we actually call this a protofilament. Not even kidding, we call it a protofilament. This is just basically a bunch of tubulin dimers strung up together to a bead. <laughs> and then what we do is we take 13 of these protofilaments together and make them into this hollow tube. So we take 13 of these puppies and we make this hollow tube. And this is your microtubule. So you see how there's a lot of things that go into this one. Another thing is there's a degree of kind of anatomy um, uh, with respect to the ends of the microtubules, which I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later, but there is what's called a positive end of the microtubule and a minus end of the microtubule. What I like to use to remember this is that the minus end or the negative end points towards the nucleus of a cell and the positive end usually points towards the periphery of the cell. And we'll go over this when we talk about the next component, which is axonal transport or intracellular transport, because that's one of the really great things that these microtubules can do. They're basically the railroads of the cell. But the big thing for microtubules is that these are really the largest of all of the cytoskeletal elements. They have some degree of flexibility into them as well. They're not as tough and resilient as intermediate filaments, and they're not as flexible as the actin or microfilaments. So they're kind of in between. So what are some of the functions of the microtubules, if you will? One of the really, really cool ones is that they play a role in what's called intracellular transport. Another way that we like to design this one is it's very, the best example of this is what's called axonal transport. This is literally the most perfect example of how the microtubules play a role in transporting things across the cell, like the railroads of the cell, if you will. So here in the center, so this is what's called your axon, right? This is the axon terminal. This is where basically neurotransmitters are being released. And then here we have the body of the axon, or I'm sorry, of the neuron, I apologize. Now, when things are being transported up and down this neuron, in other words, from the body to the axon terminal, axon terminal to the body, we depend upon these microtubules here. And then how would I tell you again, if I said this is the end of the microtubule pointing towards the nucleus, this would be the minus end or the negative end. Negative end points towards the nucleus. The positive end would be the end pointing towards the periphery of the cell or the, the, the end that's not pointing towards the nucleus. Okay, so this is our microtubule. What's really cool is that there is little cute little motor proteins here. And what these motor proteins do is they use this microtubule as their railroad system. And what they can do is they can carry things in different directions. So in other words, I could use this protein to travel from the positive end to the minus end. And I could use this protein to travel from the minus end to the positive end. In order to understand this transport, which is moving from the minus end to the positive end or from the positive end to the minus end, we have to talk about these enzymes and then talk about the name of that transport. So the first one here, this enzyme, we're gonna put a K on him, a K on his chest. This is called kinesin. This is called kinesin. And kinesin does something called anterograde transport. And this is important, right? And we also can say that if it's anterograde transport, it's moving things from the minus end to the positive end. You guys have to remember that. So the minus end to the positive end. Kinesin is really good because if we think about anterograde transport, it's taking things like vesicles. You know what this vesicle may, may contain? Neurotransmitters. So it may carry vesicles containing neurotransmitters from where? From the body to the axon terminal because now these will fuse at here and then release those neurotransmitters out. Isn't that cool? So they contain things like neurotransmitters or other proteins that we have to move from the body to the axon terminal. And the other way, and we use this microtubule as the way of being able to transport these things down. But the proteins are what help us to be able to carry those things down. All right, what's the name of this other motor protein? So this other motor protein, we're gonna put, a, you know, put some Ds on that chest. So a little odd, gotta be careful there. Uh, this is called dynein. So dynein 
is important for the opposite. It's carrying things from the axon terminal towards the cell body. So this will be called retrograde. Retrograde transport. And again, important to remember that we can also say that this is going from the positive end to the minus end of the microtubule. So it's using the microtubule as the railroad to carry particular things from the positive end to the minus end towards the nucleus. That could be important. Maybe I need to carry something from like an old organelle that needs to go up to the cell body to get destroyed for a particular reason, like the lysosomes. It's, you know, he's lived his life, Good, you know, goodbye. I'm carrying old organelles back. It's just an example, right? And that's a really, really important thing to be able to understand. So again, when we talk about axonal transport, the microtubules can be used as the railroad to carry things up and down the actual neuron from axon terminal to the body. This is retrograde, utilizing dynein. Or it could be going from the cell body towards the axon terminal. So this is going to be anterior grade transport, utilizing kinesin. These are going to be your motor proteins that are utilizing the microtubule as their railroad to carry things up and down the cell. That's important. Okay, next thing that we're gonna talk about besides this aspect is cell movement. So cell movement's really, really cool. So, you know, these microtubules, they can actually help in making something on sperm cells. So here we have a sperm cell. And on the sperm cell, there is this little thing here called the flagella. And the flagella is important for being able to give the sperm cell a degree of motility. So it whips back and forth, back and forth, and helping the sperm to be able to propel through the actual female uterus up to find that ovum. And the same concept, here we have, let's say this is an epithelium of some type. This is an epithelium of some type. And this epithelium has these like little extensions coming off their membrane. So there was microvilli, there was stereocilia, guess what the last one is? Just cilia. This one is called cilia. And cilia are also important because if you think about this, one of the best examples of epithelium, you can think about this as the respiratory tract. Pretend this is mucus that's present within the airway and you need to be able to propel that mucus out of your actual respiratory tract to spit it out or cough it out. These cilia will beat they'll create like a propulsive action to move this mucus in the proper direction. So that's the two things that the microtubules help with is sperm motility and ciliary function to beat things like mucus out of the airway. You can also find this in the fallopian tubes as well. If you think about that, the fallopian tubes, if there was the egg, pretend this is the egg, and you wanna move it after you've actually fertilized it. So the sperm cell found the egg, fertilized it, and you wanna move this from the actual fallopian tube towards the actual uterine lining. The cilia and the fallopian tubes will beat it towards the actual uterus. That's cool, right? The cell maintains its shape through a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton includes the thread-like microfilaments, which are made of protein, and microtubules, which are thin, hollow tubes. The respiratory tract is lined with cells that have cilia. These are microscopic hair-like projections that can move in waves. This feature helps trap inhaled particles in the air and expels them when you cough. Another unique feature in some cells is flagella. Some bacteria have flagella. A flagellum is like a little tail that can help a cell move or propel itself. The only human cell that has a flagellum is a sperm cell. Now, what we have to do is, is we have to take a second though because this is sometimes questioned in your actual exams. When you take and look at the structure, because you're like, you're like, wait a second, microtubules, I can get how they can be involved in axonal transport. But how are they involved in making flagella and cilia? They're like cellular extensions, if you will. Yeah, let's talk about that. So I wanna look at the flagella and I wanna look at the cilia at two levels. So what I wanna do is I actually wanna come a little bit different here. I wanna look at the base. So we're gonna start off here, right here, right here. And I'm going to chop the cilia and I'm going to chop the actual flagella right at the base. So we're going to start at the base 
of the flagella and the base of the cilia. When you cut it and you create a transverse section, this is what it looks like. And it's actually really, really cool. Because what you're gonna notice here is you're gonna notice these triplets. So you notice this triplet here? How many are there? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine triplets. You know what that actually is interesting? We call this nine times three orientation. So that means that there is nine groups here, and each one of these groups contains three microtubules. So how many microtubules make up the base of the cilia and flagella? 27 microtubules. So that means that I can have upwards of 27 microtubules that can make up the base of this cilia and flagella. So again, this is for the flagella, and this is also for the cilia. We give this a particular name. We don't like to call it the base, so we just add a little bit to it. We call it two names. So we actually call it the centriole, but the preferred name when it's applied to the flagella and the cilia is actually called the basal body. It's actually called the basal body. So it's easy to remember because it's at the base of the cilia and the flagella. Now, as we go upwards, so imagine that this actual kind of cilia or flagella is continuing upwards, and I'm just taking another section of it. So as I continue to go upwards here, I cut a little bit farther down. So then I go all the way out maybe to this point or this point of the cilia and the flagella. So now I'm getting towards the top of the cilia and the flagella. It takes a tiny bit of a difference in anatomy and structure. So again, this is for the flagella and this is for the cilia. At this point here, what do we notice? Okay. Let's count how many of these we have. We have doublets here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine doublets plus two in the center of that actual flagella and cilia. So two in the center. You know what we say this one is? This is nine times two plus two. <laughs> So that means that there's doublets. So there's two microtubules here and then nine groups of them plus two in the center. So that means that there's 18 microtubules in the periphery and then two microtubules in the center for a total of 20 microtubules that make up these dang cilia and flagella. This is also known as the axoneme. So they call this part the axoneme. So we have the two components of the cilia and the flagella. One is we can call it two names, we can call it the centriole. Technically though, it should be called the basal body for flagella and cilia. That's the nine times three arrangement. Nothing in the center. As we go further up the cilia and the flagella, we come to the axoneme, which is towards the top of the cilia and flagella. That loses that triplet and now it becomes doublets and you have the doublet in the center there, okay? This is the big structural thing that you have to understand for the components of the flagella and the cilia. So we know what they do and we know what the makeup of it is. The last component of the microtubules is that they're also involved in cell division. Which one of the uh, cytoskeletal elements was also involved in uh, cell division? Do you guys remember? The microfilaments, particularly actin was involved in cytokinesis. Well this one <laughs> it can do a couple different things. So here we start off our mitosis with prophase. Then we go into something called metaphase, right? So you have prophase, interphase, and then you have metaphase, then you have what's called anaphase. I'm just hitting the big ones that are relevant and per, uh, pertinent to this case, the microtubules. Telophase. And then we come to the last one, which is basically you undergo cytokinesis and you separate and you make one cell, two cells. Now, prophase, interphase, not too worried about that. We kind of condense down the actual DNA into chromosomes. And then what we do is we line the chromosomes up along the center axis of the actual cell. And then at the ends, at the ends if you will, I'm going to kind of do this in this color here. We have these things here that will, actually I'm sorry, we're going to form at the opposite poles. So they have to form at the opposite poles. So they'll form down here, the opposite ends. So we have the actual chromosomes that will line up along this axis here, and then we'll have these things, which are part of microtubules, lining at these ends. And we're going to do the same thing here. So what these are, which 
which are really interesting here. We're going to kind of make like a cross. This is microtubules, but they're conformed into two things. So you know how we have a microtubule in a 9 times 3 arrangement? What was that called? When you take a 9 times 3 arrangement of a microtubule, that was called a centriole. Right? We said if it was particular for the flagella or the cilia, it was called a basal body. But for right now, we're going to call this a centriole. If we take two centrioles, this makes something called a centrosome. That is what's right there at these ends. So the centrosomes, which are made up of two centrioles, which is made up of 27 microtubules, so in this case it would be 27 times 2, these are going to form at the ends. So there's one centriole, there's a second centriole, second centriole, second centriole. These are making your centrosomes. These will form at the ends here. And what they'll do is they'll give off these things called mitotic spindles. And these mitotic spindles will extend all the way from the centrosome and connect all the way to the chromosomes. So if you imagine here, here is a centrosome here. Here is a centrosome here. And I'm just going to draw one of these chromosomes. I'm going to zoom in on one of them. Here is your centromere of the chromosome. Right around the edge, there's this protein component called the kinetochore. It's called the kinetochore. These centrosomes will create these things called mitotic spindles that will click and connect with the kinetochore of this chromosome. And then what they'll do is, is they'll start to kind of pull and separate these, the chromosome. This is a sister chromatid, this is a sister chromatid. We're going to separate these apart. So this is metaphase right here. Then what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start pulling the sister chromatids apart. So what would that look like? That would look like this. Where now I've separated the sister chromatids, and I get this. So you see how now what I did is I just separated these poppies. So what I would do is I would literally kind of disintegrate this kind of bond here. And then what you would get as a result out of this is you would get the separation of the sister chromatids. And then they would start going to opposite ends of the cell. So here they were in the middle. At this point, they'll start moving towards the opposite ends, towards the centrosome. Then at the end of it, we'll have them start to kind of like create like this little divot in the cell so that we can start beginning to separate the genetic material between these two cells because we want to be able to create two cells out of this. And this is going to be the telophase. And then eventually, the whole goal would be to take this genetic material and to put this into these two cells and have an equal amount of that material there. Isn't that cool? So that's what the microtubules are involved in. They are helping to make something called a centrosome. The centrosome from it extends all the way out to the chromosomes via the, these structures here. What are these called? Mitotic spindles, which connect to the chromosomes at the kinetochore and separate them during the cell division process. That's the microtubules. So my friends, in this video, we covered all the things about the cytoskeleton. We cover their structure, we cover their function in great detail. I hope it made sense, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Love you, thank you, and as always, until next time.